Hey everyone, it's Jim from Vows and More, an online vintage tube store. And today, in tube lab number 25, we're going to roll the EL34 tube on the Wilson Tin R8 integrated amplifier. Now, we're going to try to do two things at the same time. We're going to have our first big look at the lovely sounding EL34, also known as the 6CA7 in North America. And we're going to review this power tube using the Wilson Tin R8. So, for many of you who have the R8, this will give you a, a direct review of a big selection of BL34s. And for those of you that have a, a Class AB or push-pull am amplifier, your sound will, signature will probably be quite similar to what I'm reviewing on the Wilsonton. But first, caution everyone, electronics and tube amplifiers can have very high voltages present, which can be lethal. Exercise extreme caution when working around them. Always consult a professional technician when in doubt. And if you're enjoying these videos, please hit the like button and subscribe. All the reviewed tubes exhibit at low noise. Up first is the Electroharmonix EL34. Let's take a quick look at it. It's got a big boxy gray plate with two ventilation slots. Very typical of these tubes. You can see here that it's got four rivets up the side of the plate on each side. Electroharmonix has this beautiful stylized logo, this lion that I really like quite a bit. And like um, uh, many Russian tubes, they put the year first. So this is 2018, the 11th week. And up at the top, it's got an interesting getter. In fact, the EL34 has all had quite interesting getters. So it's got look, what looks like an upside down plate that's solid in the middle with two supports on each side, two copper rods. And of course, with the upper getter, you get a nice big chrome dome. Let's put the lion up. So how did they sound? Bass was good plus, with nice tone and attack, a touch forward, but a touch muddy. Mid-range was good, clean, clear, and crisp, but also a touch dry. Treble was good, also the three C's. However, the notes didn't carry far and sounded a bit choked. Overall, this is a good sounding, rock solid, reliable tube, and given how little they cost, I'm going to award it a budget best buy. Next, we've got a Mullard reissue EL34 with a lovely logo. Look at that reproduced Mullard logo. Now, this has got nothing to do with the real vintage Mullard tubes, other than the fact that they've, they've taken the, the logo and the name. And we're going to look at a real Mullard at the very end. Now, let's compare the Mullard reissue with the Electroharmonix. And if you look at them closely, you'll see that they're very, very similar tubes. There's some difference in the spacers, how they're made, but not a lot of difference, folks. And in fact, when I went to review the Mullards, they sounded very much like the Electroharmonix, which is not surprising because they're both made by the same New York-based company, New Sensor. Their plant is in Russia, um, Saratov, I believe. And um, the Mullards had the same um, choked a high frequency problem that the Electroharmonix did. So I'm not going to waste any more time reviewing these. Let's just move on. Next is the SED Svetlana EL34, also known as the Flying C, for one of the logos they used. This is a much-loved vintage EL34 that ceased production in St. Petersburg, Russia, back around 2002. Let's take a quick look at some of them. Now, this is the big stylized S logo, and it's got um, the typical boxy plate structure, but if you look at it, it's got welds. So it's a welded plate. At the top, we've got a typical Russian flying saucer getter. But we've got a pair of them. Let me see if I can get them on camera for you. And they're usually thrown up there offset like that. And of course, the chrome dome. I've got a bunch of others lying around here. Let me go and grab them for you. So here is 
the logo everybody loves. There's your flying C. Can you see it? There it is. Now, like any high production EL34, um, a lot of equipment manufacturers will rebrand, a lot of tube manufacturers will rebrand. And in this case, look at that gorgeous Marshall logo. Let's see if we can get it on camera. There we go. Isn't that lovely? Now, are, are these tubes the same tube? They've all got these different logos on them. They, yes, they're exactly the same tube. Okay, so how did they sound? Bass was very nice. Nice tone and clarity. Neutral. Mid-range was very nice. Eva Cassidy sounded like she was right in front of me in a small club. Treble was good, plus clean, clear, and crisp with a nice finish. In my notes, I wrote detail, detail, detail. And with detail often comes a nice soundstage, and these tubes didn't disappoint. For my favorite style of music, small ensemble acoustic, classical or jazz, or folk, this is a great tube. For anyone who likes a lot of detail and a dynamic, even presentation of the music, you'll like this tube as well. I'm going to award it best of the mid-priced vintage EL34s. Next we've got the vintage Tesla EL34, made in the former Czechoslovakia, and this most definitely is not the same as the reissue, or I should say the reissue is definitely not the same as this. Now let's start with the box because I actually have a quad with original boxes that is testing nice and strong and matched and the boxes are gorgeous. Look at them. Isn't that just that? That's one of my favorite two boxes of all time. I only have one quad in, in really good shape boxes. Often with vintage boxes you'll be suspicious and you'll have a good look at it and you'll think is this is this a fake? There's lots of reproduction boxes out there, and I had a good look at this, and this is the real McCoy, folks. Okay. And let's take a quick look at the tube itself. So Tesla had this lovely Art Deco stylized logo. Remember, Tesla goes way back. That they were manufacturing tubes for a long time. I don't know the exact start date. Tesla himself um, either invented or discovered AC electricity, and he did much of his research uh, in New York City, believe it or not. In fact, the very first um, AC electricity was generated, commercially, was generated at um, tunnel number one and tumble, tunnel number two at Niagara Falls in Ontario. And I believe the first city to be lit was nearby Buffalo. And the entire uh, system was all designed by Tesla with a group of engineers working under him at Westinghouse. Everything, the, the poles, the wires, the transformers, the substations, everything had to be designed and built from scratch. If Tesla wasn't a visitor from another time or place, I don't know who would be. Um, anyways, it's got the typical... <laughs> back on track, folks. You can tell I think I think highly of, of, uh, of Tesla. Um, now, I don't think the plant had anything to do with Tesla himself. I think they just took the name. Um, but somebody can correct me in the comment section. So we've got a welded boxy gray plate with two fairly narrow slots. Shields on top. It's got an interesting getter. So let's take a look at the getter. So we've got two fairly heavy halo getters sort of overlapping, one on each stem or support rod. And when you have a pair like that, they're called double O getters. And of course a chrome dome. Okay. So how did they sound? Bass was good. Very nice in fact. Good tone and attack. Clean and a touch forward. Mid-range was good, clean, clear and crisp. However, a touched recess or back, which is a little unusual in an EO34. Treble was clean, clear and crisp. This tube had good detail, the music popped nicely, and it had a great sound stage. Overall, a very nice vintage EL34. However, they're expensive and hard to find enough to match up quads. Next, we've got a higher production EL34. Probably similar production numbers as the Svetlana. 
made by RFT of the former East Germany. This tube was rebranded by so many well-known tube manufacturers and equipment suppliers that it's hard to keep track of them all. But it was such a good tube that even Siemens used it as their own. Let's have a quick look at this one. In fact, this one's branded S-Service, so Siemens Service. And I'm guessing that this was actually a, tur a tube a tube that was used um, to service equipment, probably under contract, but maybe I got that completely wrong. Now, they've got really ugly rivets, so they're very easy to recognize. There's four on each side. Look at, let me just rotate it so you can see. See, they left the metal all just pushed right through. At a distance, you really can't see the details of a tube. It's got the two shields on top, which is common. This one has a single large halo getter of good thickness, and of course, a chrome dome. Okay, so how did they sound? Bass was good plus. Nice tone and attack. Natural and a touch forward. Mid-range was good plus plus. Clean, clear, and crisp, but a touch dry. It almost made it into the very good category. But that dryness... Uh, it kept it down there. It's still an excellent mid-range, but it, it couldn't quite climb out of that good plus plus. Overall, oh, sorry, and treble was good plus, exhibiting the three C's, as I like to call them, clean, clear, and crisp, with a nice bit of sparkle. Overall, a very nice EL34, with a nice sound stage and good detail. It was, it was, was. If it was more affordable, I'd be inclined to put it slightly ahead of the Svetlanas, maybe. But with a lot of demand for the RFT, the prices are high. Okay, last, but definitely not least, is the real Mullard EL34. The test quad are actually two fairly closely matched pairs. My last quad sold before I even had time to put them into the store inventory. In fact, I listened to them only for a couple of minutes. Now these are branded Phillips, which is not surprising because Phillips owned Mullard, of course. Now, with any tubes that have either etched or printed at the top, or anywhere on the tube for that matter, Great Britain, that should be a real big hint that you might be holding a Mullard. Now, you can't see the date codes, they're very faint or almost rubbed off on this particular tube, but the the Mullard EL34s came in series. So there was an XF2 that I know of, a 3, a 4, and the one of the most desirable accessible ones, because the early ones um, are... I can't even describe the kind of money, huge money, <laughs> for the early ones. But by the 1960s, we had the XF2 series. And these are, they're still available, they're very expensive. I, I have a lot in stock because I, you need a lot of, of inventory to match up quads and pairs. Um, but the reason the XF2s have really caught on, I think, with, uh, with, with tube lovers is A, they sound great, and we'll talk about that in a minute. But B, um, the British sound that came out in the 1960s the Beatles and the British Invasion Bands, as we call them in North America, the ones that came storming across the Atlantic, um, many of them were using uh, Muller DL-34s in their sound systems, and that gave them that, that unique, really lush sound. And we'll talk about it in a minute. Um, and some of these had this... It's hard. I'm not sure if I'm colorblind or not, but... It looks like a very dark brown base. It almost looks black. And so most of the ones I come across have a, just sort of a matte black base. The same tube. The nice thing about Mullard's and Phillips tubes and all of their subsidiaries and companies that they bought out over the years is they, they all use those, those codes. I've got a, a YouTube on reading those codes. And um, it's really quite easy. And if the code's intact, you know the tube you've got pretty much for sure. As far as I know, I've never seen a counterfeited code. It's probably not easy to do an acid etch code that's that small. Okay, how did they sound? Bass was good plus, with a nice rich tone and a touch forward. Mid-range was excellent. 
Yep, I know I never tick my top category. Not for any tube. Well, not for very many. My notes read, wow, wow, wow. That's not very descriptive, is it? Okay, mid-range was clean, clear, and crisp. Or the three C's. It had some punch, but with a rich, full sound. To quote the English who built these beauties, it was bloody marvelous. Treble was good plus with nice extension. Okay, that was the good news. They truly are lovely sounding tubes. At least the XF2 series that I'm familiar with and that I stock. The bad news is that they are a very high demand tube. Prices seem to be going up every single day. I've been debating if I can afford to play them myself. Now, I've got, I've got the two pairs in, and I feel that it's going to take at least a week to figure out if they sound good. What do you guys think? Okay, so where are we at with tubes for the R8? Well, I think we're back where we started from. The Electro Harmonix for a power tube is a great budget buy, I think. And compared to the Chinese tube that came with my amp, this thing blows the doors off of it. The Chinese tubes, were none of them were matched. Not the power tubes, nothing. <laughs> Nada. <laughs> so, it's not, I mean, it's not really a fair comparison, is it? Because if the Chinese um, quad of EL34s had been tightly matched, as they should have been, um, they made it sound better. It makes a huge difference with things like soundstage. If you, if, yes, you can bias your tubes and dial them right in, but if you started off with a very mismatched quad, they're not going to push and pull very nicely together, in my opinion. Okay, I still think that the Svetlana is a great choice, but any of the tubes I've reviewed, other than the one that's not here anymore, would be an excellent choice. The problem, of course, is accessibility and price. So you get, in my opinion, you get a great sounding tube. It's not cheap, but you get it for a reasonable amount of money for a quad of these Svetlanas. If I had the money, I'd buy the Mullards any day, every day. Absolutely, they sounded that good. In fact, if I had the money, I'd buy a lot of them. So I had to have them to my dying day. In fact, I'd have an amp at my funeral playing my favorite music on my favorite tubes, if I could manage it. Okay, well, that's that was morbid, Jim. Um, next week, we'll plug in the other type of power tube the R8 can use. So we're going to do a big review on beam tetrodes, namely the 6550 and KT88s. And we'll see how she does with those higher output tubes. We'll also have more time, so we'll take a deeper look at the schematic as I've had a couple of viewers ask for more. And before we go, let's take a look at what came in this week. And a really interesting tube came in. A whole bunch of them. Whoa, look at that, two top caps. Isn't that exciting? One of them is the plate, and one of them is the grid. And they, many of them have got the original logo, which you got to take these logos off before you fire these tubes. But these are new old stock tubes, and they're old tubes. See, it says, made in England for um, uh, Gecko or Gecko valve. That's actually G-E-C. Um, so that's General Electric uh, UK. It says down here, the General Electric Company LTD of England. And... For many, the later valves, um, in fact, GE, they would be labeled, later valves were labeled GEC. They didn't have all this fancy wording and stuff on that I can't pronounce. <laughs> but they were labeled GEC, and the GEC valves are absolutely famous for high quality, high quality sound, high quality construction, and of course they made one of the most famous KT-88s of all time. And, you know, if we thought the Mullard's EL34s were expensive. You don't want to look at what a quad of, of GEC KT8s would cost you. New old stock. Now, what the heck is this tube? Well, this is a DET20. And that stands for Dull Emitter Transmitter. Isn't that boring? And the tubes go way back, I think, to 1935. They were a big time 
uh, Second World War II. That's the mil the mil spec uh, uh, designation. The civilian tubes were called CV sixes or common valve number six. Isn't that that's straightforward? Um, and what these are is a double top cap um, 6J5. Now, that probably doesn't mean anything to anybody out there, or not very many of you, but a 6SN7, which is one of my favorite preamp tubes, is a pair of 6J5s inside. Ah, you say, now that's why you're interested in these tubes. Aha, uh -huh. absolutely. People have talked about these as being the very best sounding 6SN7 that they've ever heard. And I've got a whole bunch of them new old stock. I have to, I actually have to make a modification to my tester so that I can double cap these suckers. Because even though I've got a plate connection, I don't have one for the grid. But that's not hard. Well, I'll make a plug and uh, install a plug on the tester and we'll get these things tested up. One way or the other, it's going to happen. Okay. If you stay to the end, here's some discount codes for you. Remember, I've got flat rate shipping around the world of $20. And if your order is $150 or more after discount, the shipping's on me. Stay safe, everyone. This is Jim from Valves and More, signing off. Cheers, everyone.